Hi, y'all. This is a video response to Dr. Moriarty's response to my video to him. Um, I'm sorry to be so long in getting back to you on this, Dr. Moriarty, but uh, as you may have heard, there's been an election in the United States, and I have just been really following the fallout from the failure of uh, the media and the left to get their way, and I'm loving the temper tantrum. But, back to this particular video, and hello everyone else. So, whenever I address people from the social justice warrior camp, or the left wing, even though I'm not in the right wing, uh, but from the left wing, I'm always on my guard, Dr. Mori Moriarty, and one of the reasons for it is the way that they like to play with words and, uh, you know, bait and switch and make things sound like uh, something that they aren't. And uh, notwithstanding that, I also make sure that I give each particular person I address their proper due. I give them the opportunity to show whether or not they're going to fall in line and be like the others, or to be different and be intellectually honest. I don't want to commit an ecological fallacy by painting the individual with the sins of the group, uh, w uh, groups with which they are affiliated. Now, I have to say, uh, I gave you such opportunities, and you've, do you've not done anything to persuade me that you are different from the run-of-the-mill leftist. So, uh, I'll just start with a rather trivial example. Um, my, in my video to you, the first sentence I spoke to you was about uh, your, how you're condescending and the way that you come off on camera to a lot of people, which, were, which these views were addressed in videos done by even some feminists in response to the original video that you guys put out uh, through the Christy, uh, Christy Winters channel um, about how you're condescending. One of them was uh, like in a study in Smugitude or something like that was one of the videos. Other people are noticing this. Now, what I said in that sentence was that you do have that, and that is going to put some people off. And then I said, but I don't mind it. Now, you reversed my expressed position in your first comment to me, your only comment to me, such as I know. Uh, you, you said, I'm sorry that you find my camera style off-putting, and so you were going to do something in written form. And, and I warned you then, do not misrepresent what it is that I have said to you. I know what I think. I know why I think it and I know what I said, and I know why I said it. Now, you could have just misheard that. I can't prove one way or the other whether you misinterpreted it, uh, you had a brain fart, or if you have just decided to be careless with the truth. I don't know what the answer is, but looking at that piece of information does not give me confidence that you're going to be an honest broker in this conversation. There are other guideposts. For example, you complained at several points in your video about the fact that, uh, I mentioned people who aren't you, you would complain by saying, I'm not Christy Winters. Now, I get part of that is it's funny for your audience, you know, I get that. Uh, and then later on, you say, uh, again, I'd just like to remind everyone, I'm not Dr. Winters. I'm aware that you're not Dr. Winters. I'm aware that you're not Jerry Coyne. I'm aware that you're not anybody else but yourself. Um, now, your complaint was that I addressed a video to you by name. Uh, no normal person is going to think that uh, when a person addresses another person, that that address, that direct address, thereby restricts the exclusive topic to be discussed, just the person who has been addressed. It's a form of address. It isn't um, some kind of parameter that constrains the conversation to address only that topic. Or if you think that it is, I bet you're fun to be around at the dinner table when one of the kids says, Dad, earlier today, Mom, hey, look, uh, I'm not Mom. Don't talk to me about Mom. You address me. You only talk about me. No one's going to do that. No emotionally normal person or mentally normal person is going to do that. Now, another problem with dealing with people from the left is that you like to bloviate at length, ad nauseum, about context. You've got to remember the context. And yet you feel completely unconstrained by context. Your video response to me was an open address or open letter or whatever the hell was named to a, um, a social science skeptic. Yes, well, of course I'm a social science skeptic. I'm a skeptic. Social science is not exempted. Should I draw the negative implication from that, that you are a social science believer, an unskeptical viewer of social science? I don't know. Maybe, well, I know that you're not. So it would not be proper for me to do that. But that is a way of crafting a narrative. This is how the conversations go. The actual context, aka the parameter, the constraints on the conversation, were the ones that I specified at the outset of my video before I ever directly addressed you. One, the video that you did in collaboration with Christy Winters at all that was posted on her channel. And two, the response videos to you and your response to the ones that you chose to respond to. That's the context. 
So you have turned that, am I making mention of some, some dodgy uh, areas of social science, as though it is a freestanding um, uh, dismissal of all possible social sciences, or the overwhelming majority of social science work. You brought up economics, which I never mentioned. Uh, as, as though there was not a constraint imposed on the system. When there was, there was a parameter imposed from the outset. I made it a point to make sure that I started off with that because I know how you, you people on the left love to craft narratives. You like to weave them to be something other than what they are. And uh, I'm sad to say, you don't seem to be the exception from that uh, mode of operation. Now, you, uh, around three minutes, you were complaining that I haven't defined what is an SJW. We are both confronted with Lord Byron's problem. Uh, a gentleman. What, is a gen what are the defining traits of a gentleman? No one can precisely define uh, an exhaustive list of the, the traits that a gentleman has or the particular proportion that they'll share. But we all know what a gentleman is when we see one. There's no confusion between what is a gentleman and what is an asshole. In the South, where I'm from, gentlemen stand up the first time a woman enters a room. The fact that you might find a legless person who is also a gentleman doesn't disqualify them from being a gentleman because they don't stand up when a woman walks into a room. You gave a for example. If you're not into no platforming, does that make you an SJW? Now, I don't recall your video starting off with an exhaustive list of what constitutes an anti-SJW. There were conditions that were imposed, you know, the context of the conversation, by you originally and in your follow-up. And at and in neither video did you delineate a list of what qualifies someone to be an SJW or disqualify someone from being an SJW, or more particularly, to take it from your end, what makes a person an anti-SJW. But I did a little bit of research, you know, something you've advised me to do, and I asked a lot of people who know you what your actual view is on the distinction between SJW and SJW. And I am reliably informed, I think, that your position is that... What I want to point out, first of all, is I, I do think that this division between SJWs and anti-SJWs is problematic. It's a useful sort of very gross distinction, very broad distinction, to place different people into different camps. So that's the context of the conversation, which you seem to ignore. I don't have an obligation to start defining parameters that you yourself did not think were, were sufficiently weighty to put in ab initio. If you thought that these were like something that really needed to be addressed to have a conversation on the subject, it's completely inexplicable why it appears nowhere in your original work. And, and until you run away from that original work and disavow yourself, or disavow that original work, it is going to hang around your neck like a sword of Damocles. You are just stuck with it until you disavow it. I mentioned, by the way, that I'm going to be using a bit of a wedge strategy here with you. You should not be surprised that I'm going to be holding you to the actual context of the conversation that you yourself chose to start off with. Don't come whining to me that unless I can delineate the properties and the traits that create an SJW, and that because there is a problem whenever you deal with categories, that somehow the problem is a feat on my end, because you yourself fully accepted that as a coarse grain model, it is a perfectly uh, workable system to, uh, to have in order to have a discussion. But then when the conversation starts getting inconvenient for you, you want to cry foul and say, well, you've got, you need to be thinking about doing this. No, I don't, and I don't need to do it for the same reason you didn't need to do it from the outset. We both are met on, on, uh, with a rough approximation of what it is we're talking about. Or if you think that it really is necessary to have these kinds of conversations when you're discussing categories, then I expect to start seeing you at biological conventions whenever you discuss, uh, whenever biology comes up, to start talking about, oh, we can't discuss uh, species until we really nail down a, a definition that includes everything we want to include and excludes everything we don't want to be included, which you can't really do at the species level, at the genus level, or even the family level, because you have bleed over where, where uh, you interspecific hybrids, intergeneric hybrids, and interfamilial uh, familial hybrids. Uh, you know, they are able to reproduce, create, uh, you know, uh, fertile offspring. So the division is not as clear as we would like it. And one of the reasons for this 
is that though logic and mathematics are very useful in describing nature, they don't do a perfect job. There is always, always a disconnect between the model and reality. And the fact that we can't perfectly map the terrain doesn't mean that it, it becomes vacuous to talk about the terrain without discussing why it is we have failed to perfectly map it. Okay, anyway. Uh, now, on that complaint uh, about how I failed to delineate some of the criteria, you're also just wrong. Go to 2630 of your video where you're complaining about the, some of the criteria that I was delineated about the properties of that camp that we're talking, whatever label you want to put on it. The SJW, the, the you know, third wave feminist, uh, the left, whatever you want to call that area of, of people, that grouping of people who are the subject of what we're discussing, that we all seem to understand what the people we're discussing, uh, I delineated some of their properties and you took issue with it. So far from my not uh, delineating various things, I did, and you just you, you uh, are aware of it, you made a response to it in your video at the end, but at the beginning of your video you pretended as though that just didn't happen. Okay, uh, around 420 of your video you're talking about how you're aware that you can be condescending and that it's often deliberate. Yeah, I know, I love that. One of the reasons I don't have a problem with your tone is, well, this ties in with another point about uh, my supposed view of various fields and how some are inferior or superior to others. Um, the, the reason I like it when people are condescending is because typically they haven't calibrated the level of their hubris to the actual throughput of their ability. So whether it is a recipient throwaway clause in like Star Wars, you know, double the pride, twice the fall, or an aphorism of a great religion like, uh, you know, pride precedes the fall, or a more poetic, uh, you know, um, restatement of the same idea from like, uh, you know, antiquity, the tyrant is the child of pride. He drinks from his great sickening cup, recklessness and vanity, until from his high crest, headlong he plummets to the dust of hope. You know, whether it's, it's Sophocles, whether it's the Bible, whether it's George Lucas, I, when I look out there, like the character Josh Lyman says in the series West Wing about Josiah Bartlett, not just for the McNuggets. I reach out there to try to get it all. Not restricted to just science, but what I never do is confuse literature for science. When it comes to someone who, call, who tacks the word science, unless it's fiction, onto what it is they're doing, I hold them to the standards of science, not the standards of literature. Which is to say there's a degree of rigor you can have in the scientific endeavor that you aren't going to get in literature. Not because English professors are retarded and scientists are all geniuses, it's just that they are doing two fundamentally different things that have two fundamentally different types of sources that allow them to be able to make statements in one field and with a degree of precision that can't be made in the other. That doesn't mean that, that a science is superior to the arts. They're different, and I find them both important. Now, when something says, I'm a science, like, I don't know, sociology, then I'm going to say, well, okay, you want to get into this field and be a science. You want to, and you need to justify attacking the word science on to what it is that you're doing, and you are spectacularly failing. Now, you mentioned... Um, just to talk here a little bit about sociology and, and, and social psychology and, and the, the natural sciences because you, you say I seem to have this distinction. I do. In the natural sciences, aka the actual sciences, you have definitive ways and empirical models uh, that, that will unambiguously give you conclusions. You don't get things like that in the uh, social so-called sciences that are relevant here. It's not because the people are evil necessarily. But one can't help but notice that one set of uh, fields is going through a replication crisis and the other set of fields isn't. That isn't to say that there are no replication issues in the natural sciences. There are. It's not to say that there isn't fraud in the natural sciences. It happens. You brought up a couple of examples. And it's not to say that everything that, that comes out of sociology or psychology is, is just complete bunk. But it is to say that uh, if you're looking at, uh, if you know the replication project is any, is any guide and is representative of the field, then the safest course of action that you should do, writ large, when viewing uh, research from these fields is to believe the complement of whatever the conclusion claims that it is. You will be right more often by believing the complement of the proposition than by believing the actual proposition. That is not a hallmark of the scientific enterprise. That, well, we're wrong most of the time, but it's the best we can do. Now, I'm going to talk a little bit more about that later on when you, uh, well, later on. Um, 
on the issue regarding the clarification on conjunction and substitution, you are still, still not listening. You are hearing what you want to hear rather than actually listening to what people are saying. They are not saying, okay, your position that you had that I addressed was talking about if we're going to say we're going to be about the rationality, we need to jettison the emotions and focus only on rationality. My response to that line of argument was that you can have both. Your response to my response is that you argued that we can have both. You are missing a crucial part of the argument here, sir. I said you have a misunderstanding. I didn't say the people who are making the argument are confused. You, not they, are confusing substitution and conjunction. They aren't asking for substitution. They aren't asking for exclusion. They are asking for conjunction. So here's the context of the way these conversations work. Feminist gets up and whines and whines and whines and whines and whines about her emotion. Person listens to it and says, yeah, well, that's fine and well, but you have a little bit of data to back that up. Okay? This gets translated. It, it takes different forms. You know, the conversation goes slightly different ways. But you translate that request to, it is only, this person is now saying it is not, no longer uh, acceptable for a person to speak of their emotions, that they want a strictly logical argument, which is something that you say you get asked over and over again. I've looked through your comments. I haven't seen it. I've looked through other comments. I haven't seen it. Uh, now, maybe someone has actually said, I uh, hereby declare, Hakamalika, that I will only accept and will only tolerate, and uh, it is not permissible for you to say anything other than the presentation of a formal logical argument or a, a logical argument. They're saying, yes, we've heard all the emotional shit. Do you have any logical arguments to go with it? They are not saying that it is not permissible to talk about both. They are saying they're perfectly happy with a conjunction, which you are confused about. You take their want for some evidence, some rational argument to go along with the whole litany of I feel this, I feel the other, my feelings are this, my sense is, th is this, that, or the other, and pretend as though an, an explicit, an exclusion criterion has been imposed on the conversation. Well, it has been, but only in your head. That's the confusion that you have with substitution and conjunction. Now, you say that my example of the professor doing the uh, the proof and crying is the same as your example of what you do in the lab. No, it isn't. I was very, I, I choose my examples rather carefully, actually. And I chose the example of this guy crying while writing a proof. Unlike your example in the lab, where you do, you, there's, there's some theoretical model that you, you're thinking about. You can try a way to test it. You run the test, and then you see the conclusion, and then you have an emotional reaction. So you have event A precedes event Y, uh, event Z happens, which is your viewing Y, and then event A prime, I guess I should have started with some different letters, whatever, A prime happens, which is where you get emotional in response to the consequences of event A, uh, event X, event Y, event Z, which are not happening simultaneously. They happen in a sequence, and then, and then, and then. The then there, in a linear sequence, is important, because those aren't conjunctions. They're a sequence. You are the one who has the confusion here, not the people you're arguing, uh, that you imagine you're arguing against. Now, you brought up um, Quantum Mind and Social Science by Alexander Wendt, and you mentioned some comments you had about Karen Barad, uh, which this is after you have switched the topic of the conversation from when I said people on your side, which is you know the context that we were of the conversation we were having that I stated at the beginning of the video, which you then switched to the social science conversation for some inexplicable reason. But then you bring up Alexander Wendt, who is indeed a social scientist, and a book that he wrote where he's repining, uh, or not repining, where he's talking about physics, and then like a Tylenol milkshake mishmash hodgepodge of uh, epistemological realism and idealism, ontology, and, and metaphysics. Not a single equation appears in there. It doesn't purport to be research which is actually what I pressed you on, is the research, and then you give me a book written by a social scientist who's not trained uh, in, in physics, is not trained in mathematics, uh, who is nevertheless going to go around talking about quantum theory. If that is social science, then I guess everything Deepak Chopra writes is in fact medical science. It isn't. 
Uh, you were talking with David Bell in the comments, who works in sociological fields but does not identify as a social science for the reasons he describes. It is entirely possible to work in these liberal art fields without claiming the pretense of, being, of doing science, and I don't have an objection with the same kind of woo that they will propose as I will when a person claims that what they are doing is science. The example I gave you of that was Christy Winters, who is a social scientist. She claims to be one. She was doing what she calls social science, and she was uh, presenting a lecture in a way that people can actually do replicate her science to know that what she's saying is true. Now, given the opportunity to respond to that, your inner coward comes out and you say, I'm not Christy Winters. I can't presume to speak for Christy Winters. I didn't ask you to explain what her motivation is or to represent her views. I presented to you an argument that she's made, it's publicly made, my response to her uh, publicly made argument, and the best that you could say is, well, I'm not her. I know you're not. You're not Karen Barad. You didn't have any problem talking about her problems. Uh, you're not Alexander Wendt. You didn't have any problem talking about his errors. Uh, or apparently, um, when you're asked to respond to, to what someone has said, if you're going to really run through the logic of that's a re that uh, responding to what the person has said is representing their interests, then I, I guess uh, they owe you money for being their representative for talking about their work. Now, Karen Barad, she has a degree in physics, particle, physis, uh, particle physicist, I think, who is now a philosopher and a feminist theorist who doesn't work in social science. She works in the humanities department. I don't read what people in the humanities departments write on these issues. I don't care what they have to say. And she wasn't describing science. She's describing what she learned from feminism and how that lets her think about uh, physics. What she said is bullshit, but she's not claiming that her understanding from feminism thereby transforms what science is. When we're talking about what science is, it is the ex-cathedra program of science. It isn't what some scientist might say in an interview or some bullshit they might write in a book, or if it is, as I said, then Deepak Chopra's every book is actual medical science, and indeed, more than that, it is cutting-edge medical research, except that it's neither. And your little uh, example with the nanobagels shows that, you're, that you know the difference between is science and is not science. And the fact that a scientist says something in an interview doesn't transform that into science, let alone into social science. She didn't claim to be doing social science. She positively disclaimed to be engaging in the scientific enterprise. But for some reason, you tell me to do my research. I have done my research, sir. You remind me of me when I was a kid, and I thought it was clever to play these little analytic games with words. The wordplay was very clever. From that day to this, I've learned a few things, and over the course of time, I've managed to up my standards, sir. Now up yours. Now on to the actual pregnant uh, um, provocative issue here which is when I put it to you, oh, real quick, on the, uh, the Zeman thing, I asked you for some scientific, some sociological studies, some sociological research, and you give me a book written by a guy who was a feminist who, uh, I'm sorry, not a feminist, a guy who was a physicist, went into sociology, um, and you read from the preface. Yet earlier, when you were talking about problems in, fi in physics, you actually presented studies that were wrong. I asked you for those. And then you've done a bait and switch with the book, and the preface from the book in particular. I, and talking about the motivation, why? Look, I understand the motivations. The motivations don't change the science. The person's motivations are wholly irrelevant to the data and the analysis of, of uh, those data. Now, suppose I were talking, by the way, I'm not going to claim that you are a magic proponent. This is something called an example, and I'm going to use a hypothetical person which I'm not saying you are that hypothetical person, just so you don't get confused about my talking about something that isn't exclusively you. You're welcome. So, um, talking to someone about magic, and they tell me that, oh yeah, the magic is real, and I go, well, I'm a bit of a magic skeptic here. Show me the goods. And then they hand me a Harry Potter novel. Well, that's great, but you claim that this shit is science, and that it works. Science involves empiricism. You should be able to make some demonstrations here. I'm asking you to show me which of these spells you can encant that will produce the effects that you claim the magical spells produce. It's no response to that to say, well, if you read an introduction to this Wiccan manual, it will talk about how wonderful it would be if the world worked this way. Of course it would be wonderful if the world worked that way. The question isn't, wouldn't it, would it be great if that was true? The question is, is it in fact true? And if it is, how can you go about showing that it is in fact true? I hate to tell you, reading the preface from a book written by a guy who's overwrought with the, uh, the, the quest of learning more about society, 
doesn't make it social science, doesn't make it science, and it doesn't make it interesting, and I don't give a fuck about it. Ask you for some research, and if that's the best you can do, I guess it's the best that you can do. Now, uh, it's interesting that you mentioned Alexander Wendt. I forgot to mention this earlier. Because he, uh, uh, on the, the Karen Barad thing, on your reformulation of changing your side to social science, that wouldn't qualify even on your metric. Because as uh, you showed to David Bell, what she's doing isn't even science. Uh, and if it's not in, in the Bailiwick of science, then it's certainly not in the Bailiwick of any of its subsets. Now, on the Alexander Wendt thing, that can't possibly satisfy what I actually asked for. He's not on your side. He's a social constructivist, which is a rival theory of feminism, which is necessary for the social justice program, the social justice warrior program. It is the bedrock of it. It underpins all of it. Uh, social constructivism positively, positively disclaims gender uh, and refutes feminism in power. In feminism, power is an intrinsic property, it's an intrinsic trait, whereas in constructivism, it's an extrinsic pressure that's not inherent in the system. And gender is completely irrelevant. Now, some 20 years ago, feminist theorists in social sciences, and uh, feminist theorists not in social science, uh, decided to do what they always do when they can't get someone to just believe whatever they say. They co-opt something else. So in this case, they started writing a series of articles about um, constructivism and feminism. Worlds apart or occupying the same middle ground. No, they're not occupying the same middle ground. Feminism is maniacally obsessed with gender. Constructivism says, shove it. It's not even a mere variable here. Go away. And constructivism is what the mainstream of international relations in this particular subfield became. It started trending that way, and the feminists were like, oh my god, we're losing our power. We need to do something to rectify this. So then they started say, uh, they wrote an article, uh, wrote a paper, mix, is either stirring gender or mixing in gender into the mainstream. And they were talking, about, this, this uh, researcher was talking about how you can still take in the, the properties of feminism, of, of gender, without claiming to be doing feminist theory. So, in other words, they're, they're, they're trying to, just, just, come on guys, just take the tip a little bit. I won't go all the way in, we promise. Just the tip, baby. Nothing more. A complete lie. Now, they didn't, get, they didn't make a lot of headway with that. So then, what did, what did feminists do? They just invented feminist constructivism, which is mainstream constructivism, as, an, as the offshoot of mainstream constructivism, which apparently to be an offshoot means you completely repudiate the central propositions of, of the field and then claim that you're really within the field. Who knew? I guess William Lane Craig is, is right about uh, Neil Lorenzian being perfectly cromulent in, in the standard model, because after all, sure, it rejects some of the fundamental uh, propositions of the model, but, you know, that's a couple propositions among friends. <laughs> so, um, I asked you about the rigor on social so-called sciences being anything like what you get in your field, and you started to say that uh, you, you, you don't agree with me on that, that, that there's nothing like it, but then you couldn't quite bring yourself to actually argue the point that the rigor they engage in is just like the rigor you engage in, and the reason that you can't do it is you would have to lie overtly. Their statistical methods do not allow them to be able to produce uh, the same goods that you can produce in the, actual, in the natural sciences. And the reason for that is, this should be no great surprise to anyone who studies statistics, correlation does not imply causation. And when you want to tease out causation, you really need to be doing experiments. It, you cannot simply be doing observational studies. And, well, it's not impossible to tease out causality in observational studies, uh, but it is very difficult, far more difficult than in, when you do experiments. Now, sometimes they don't do experiments because there are ethical constraints that would prevent them from doing it. The fact there's a good reason not to do the experiment doesn't mean that the failure to do the experiment licenses supporting propositions that are not experimentally shown. That's the distinction between doing science and philosophy. But you seem to have this sufficiently wide definition of what constitutes social science so that I'm not sure that philosophy would be excluded as being a science in your mind. It certainly isn't one in mine. And I think you mentioned string theory. String theory, I don't consider science. I can, well, I, I have Brian Greene's kind of view on this. It's not, it's not empirically accessible right now, and it may never be. And it'd be better phrased as string conjecture or string hypothesis. 
Now, so long as there's an empirical hook to the, the theoretical component, I, agree, I let the theoretical component ride as being properly a part of science. But once you get away from that empirical uh, modality, once you get away from the experiment, I'm not with you anymore. You, you've moved from doing science to doing just philosophy. Oh, it's very sophisticated. It's very mathematically impressive. You have very beautiful models. The mathematics is elegant, and if true, it would be great. The problem is that to show in science that something is true, you got to be able to produce the goods, and that is an empirical uh, in endeavor all day long. And it does not seem to be the case that string theory is going the route of empiricism, and therefore I treat it more like philosophy than science. And so too do I do that with a lot of social so-called science because it is not empirically, an empirically uh, driven field. Of course, it's possible to do it, but the fact that it's possible doesn't mean that it happens very often, and as I mentioned earlier, the safest course of action writ large is to believe the complement of the conclusion of any sociological or psychological study, and uh, you will more often than not be right doing it that way than believing the conclusions that the studies claim they have found. Now, on to the, the statistical issue. If, if you're going to do observational or survey type stuff and you want to find a correlation, I'm sorry, and you want to find causation, you're going to be looking at methods of exhaustion. You've got to be able to find some way to exclude uh, all the confounding variables. Very difficult to do if you can't control the parameters of the, if you can't set up an experiment. Now, sometimes you can, accept, you can set up an experiment. Uh, oftentimes, you cannot. And they certainly do not uh, show any inclination whatever in collecting data sets sufficiently large to allow them to exclude confounding variables when they're only looking at observation. They simply refuse to do the work and spend the money that would be required to uh, have those methods of exhaustion. And so what they do is they get correlation. But it's the worst kind of correlation. It's correlation that's restricted only to the sample. It does, they can't generalize it. Uh, yes, they come up with very sophisticated ways to say that this, that, or the other. Uh, but sophisticated nonsense is still just nonsense. I mentioned um, some of the shit that I, I read in, so, in uh, uh, social so-called science um, research, which incidentally isn't news interviews and isn't books on physics and philosophy that are written by social scientists. I mean actual research, you know. The thing that you, when it comes to physics, you're able to understand is like a paper that's gone through peer review, it has some some experimentation, and, you know, that kind of shit. Research! Anyway, they simply, uh, will, will they, they misunderstand what it is that statistics can tell them. They'll, they'll do one study, they won't replicate it, and they'll say that there's a whatever degree of confidence that the study is right. That, it's not what, that's not what statistics says. It says, if you have a perfectly designed model, uh, by chance alone, if you repeat this over many trials, 5% of the studies will have this, whatever the, the, the confidence interval, will not, will not contain the, the, uh, the actual parameter. Well, okay, that says nothing about any particular study. If you don't do the replication, you can say nothing about the veracity of, that, of any particular paper. That could be the fluke. You don't know. And it's not 95% likely that it's one or the other. That, uh, you only get the, that percent of uh, likelihood on large numbers of trials. Anyway, so in order to tease out causality, you've got to be able to block, you know, have blocking criteria so that way you can account for confounding variables. In order to generalize it, you've got to have randomness. Now, in, so, in, in the fields we're talking about here, which aren't economics in, in case you didn't know, um, they very often don't do randomness, and they very often don't do any of the other things to talk about it. It's not an experiment. So they, they have results that are restricted to the sample they've taken only. They can't be generalized. There's no causality inference that can be drawn. Uh, in your video, you started out whining about stereotyping and overgeneralizing, which somehow or other is more from just generalizing to overgeneralizing. Fancy that. When I do it, it's overgeneralizing, and then it becomes a big problem. Overgeneralizing is a problem. Generalizing is not. Uh, the reason overgeneralizing is a problem is that you are making a statement in the, in the general that exceeds the license for the claim. Generalization would only be problematic. Stereotyping would only be problematic if you think that it's a universal proposition that admits of no exceptions. And I don't know anybody who thinks that. This is another bit of the narrative crafting, narrative weaving, done by the left. Also, the right does this too, and they annoy me, but I'm not talking about them today, I'm talking about you. A person will say something, women are weaker than men. 
and then you'll get a response. I'm not saying you've made this response. This is something called an example. And you'll, oh, all women? I didn't say all. I said women. That admits of uh, either some or, or uh, all. Either is compatible with what I said. It is entirely your choice how you want to construe that. If you construe it to say all, then you have decided to construe it to mean something I never intended and something I never actually said. Now, um, you, you'll get that problem of it's being an overgeneralized statement, which is to say, in that case, a universal statement. Now, stereotypes aren't problematic, and indeed, they do better at modeling uh, society, norms in society, than sociological models do. Something like less than 5% of sociological models model more than half of a population. Something like 80 or 90%, I can't remember now. Some high proportion of stereotypes uh, do generalize. One of the reasons for this is that stereotypes don't try to get into the particulars. They don't get into the specifics. They're not dealing with parceling out all the proper subsets of the set. So, uh, you have less information in them, which is why they're more general. And they typically are based on observable reality. They're not always true. It's retarded that I have to say that, because nothing I ever said says that the stereotypes are never wrong. I never said they're perfect. So they're generally true. But dealing with people like you, I have to say, when I say generally true, I don't mean absolutely, incontrovertibly, 100% of the time, impossible to be wrong true. I mean, you know, sometimes they're wrong, but generally they're right. So you have those kinds of things. There is no problem, whatever, in having general claims. Um, so long, well, so long as they actually model reality. I mean, obviously, if you you can make a general claim that's just false, but the idea that that there is a problem in and of its intrinsic to generalizing would defeat the entire program of science. It's an inductive endeavor. What you're doing is going from the particular to the general. You're going from the specific to the abstract or to the, uh, the to a generalization. <laughs> I w I find it a little bit peculiar that a scientist would be whining about generalizing. What do you think you do all this research? programs for? What do you think all that experimentation is for? It's the way you can look at particular cases in a clever way and draw general inferences from them. <laughs> this isn't deductive reasoning. It's not. It's abductive in, in the social sciences and inductive, or I say more abductive in the social sciences and more inductive in the natural sciences. <laughs> all right, I think I'll leave it there. Have a great day. <laughs>